Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for coming out tonight to Darien Library. I'd like to briefly mention that programs at the library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. Thank you so much for your contributions that make programs like these available to the community. Tonight's guest is here to read from her most recent book of poetry, Grains of the Voice. She's also the author of Restoration and Rotary, as well as the chapbook, Gardening at Dusk. Her poems have appeared in the Atlantic Monthly, Poetry, Tri-Quarterly, Plowshares, The Kenyan Review, and other periodicals, and in anthologies such as Poetry 180. Her honors have included the World Press First Book Prize for Rotary, the Ruth Lilly Poetry Fellowship from Poetry Magazine, the Lucille Medwick Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America, an Individual Artist Fellowship in Poetry from the Illinois Arts Council, the Associated Writing Programs Intro Journals Award, the Grolier Poetry Prize, residencies at the Ragdale and UCross Foundations, and a faculty fellowship from the UIC Institute for the Humanities. We are so very fortunate to have her here with us tonight and a former Darien High School graduate. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Ms. Christina Pugh. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Um, and I'd like to thank the whole library staff um, for making this happen. Um, it's always wonderful to come back to Darien um, and to read here. So thank you to all of you for being here. Um, and as, as Patty just said, um, indeed, the real occasion for this reading is um, the publication of my new book, Grains of the Voice. Um, but I see that some of you have copies of Rotary with you. And um, what I'm going to be doing is actually reading from um, three um, books, Rotary, um, Restoration, and Grains of the Voice during this reading. Um, don't worry, we won't be here till midnight. <laughs> um, it, it will be time so that it will be manageable. But um, so I, I'm going to begin with uh, my first book, Rotary. And um, I'd like to begin with a poem called Rose City. And for many people, Rose City, um, I think, is Portland, Oregon. Um, but really, uh, s some place called Rose City can be um, wherever one is where there's a preponderance of roses growing. And for me, um, it was Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, when the roses would grow like wildfire every year um, in the gardens there. Rose City. The bleared petals in my failed photographs bloom again in the streets that become this time each year a city of roses. From railings over trellises, I'm offered cup after cup of blank, well-bottom colonies, foil to the sharpened mum or the black-eyed Susan. Like holes, the roses won't articulate, resisting me just as they resisted the camera's perspicacity, its tiny window trained on overflow. I can hear them tear at the earth's precision, quicksand, blind road, the siren sheen of the magnifying glass. Um, this next poem I'm going to read is the title poem of the book. It was called Rotary um, and is an elegy or eulogy for the rotary phone, which <laughs> maybe we don't encounter much anymore. So this one's dedicated to my dad, Rotary. Closer to a bell than a bird, that clapper ringing the clear name of its inventor. By turns louder and quieter than a clock, its numbered face was more literate. Triplets of alphabet like grace notes above each digit. And when you dialed, 
Each number was a shallow hole, your finger dragged to the silver comma boundary. Then the sound of the hole traveling back to its proper place on the circle. You had to wait for its return. You had to wait even if you were angry and your finger flew. You had to watch the round trip of seven holes before you could speak. The rotary was wired for lag, for the afterthought. Before the touch tone, before the speed dial, before the primal grip of the cellular, they built glass houses around telephones, glass houses in parking lots, by the roadside, on sidewalks. When you stepped in and closed the door, transparency hugged you. And you could almost see your own lips move, the dumb show of your new secrecy. Why did no one think to conserve the peel? Just try once to sing it to yourself. It's gone, like the sound of breath if your body left. Of course, that poem dates itself because now it would be the smartphone um, as opposed to the cellular um, that had replaced the rotary at that point. Things are always changing, technologically speaking and otherwise. A um, couple of flower poems. Hydrangea. No other flower is such a stranger to soil. Its curvature of blossom turns a whelk, a fluid syllable of seashell. For hydrangea is charged with the stain of sea change. No other flower ripens as it dies, testing the slender range of colors we can identify. Not red, not brown, hinterlands between rose and violet. We grasp as if through fog that liquid sense, cast a root in the ocean floor, somewhere deeper than we've ever been. Hydrangea waves muscular as coral, shading starfish and silt. I'm debating whether to talk about <laughs> Immanuel Kant right now or not. Um, <laughs> um, it's become a kind of joke to me in my readings that I have to mention him. Uh, one of the things that he talks about in the Critique of Judgment is that beauty is something that looks as if it has a purpose but doesn't. So what he calls is purposiveness, purposiveness without purpose. So this poem is called Amaryllis. Eight blossoms from a single bulb. It is prolific as certain mothers, as authors worth the salt of their authority. From one green trunk of stem, four flowers rise to separate music. Red petals whirl and blister, whitening their centers, framing seven stamens arched to the stained tips of their pollen sacs. When the weight of these four blossoms sways the stem, we'll stake it up, bandage it with raffia, and watch another nib stalk doubling from the bulb, while coruscated older petals thirst into husk, toughen to transparency in pleats of levied veins, correlate with dust, purposiveness, economy the world can't use or live without. Okay, this is gonna be a hard one for me to read, but I wanna do it. <laughs> it's called Book of Days. For my father and in memory of John Fiorito. You'd meet him in the wet seasons, raking leaves, pruning. You compared fertilizer, pondered stocks. He'd come inside for a glass of wine, some firelight. One November, he knew he wouldn't see Christmas. 
before the hospital, before the spasms. He kept his body's counsel. No pain, no inkling of a god. He just felt his spleen shut, his occiput shift. Then he could see you, alone in the nut brown rack of your garden in March, your head bowed to the parch for Scythia. And he provided you a book of days to find under the evergreen at Christmas. He had already written the card. He wanted you to laugh every evening. He wanted you to grow even older. So moving to uh, my book, Restoration. This book uh, was a book about dreams and dream logic and dream life um, that then sort of turned into a final section about awakening, um, awakening to the senses. Um, many of the, the poems in the, in the first um, section, actually really sort of like the first two sections um, in the book are arranged um, inspired in some ways by, by dreaming, by, by dreams. So I'm going to read a couple from the first um, section of Restoration. This poem is called Loan, Loan, like a bank loan, Loan. And then your own page loaned in prefatory light. The print dissolves into corners, letters loosened at the borders. And you read as the aviator reads, tracing the sleeve of the Chesapeake, wandering ablaze over Broadway at night. You, the prime mover, who dipped in the foam, circling your ankles and washed and wrote it all as if on water. Miles above a dust basin, deep in the continent's plexus, you felt a bitter stream scar trickle on the land. Twenty-third. And this refers to the twenty-third psalm. We all know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We all know this. Many of us do. 23rd. And at the picnic table under the ancient elms, one of my parents turned to me and said, we hope you end up here where the shade relieves the light, where we sit in some beneficence. And I felt the shape of the finite after my ether life the ratio in all dappling of dark to bright, and yet how brief my stay would be under the trees, because the voice I'd heard could not cradle me, could no longer keep me in greenery. And I would have to say goodbye again, make my way across the white California sand and back. Or am I now creating the helplessness I heard those words express? the psalm torn like a map in my hands. Um, I'm going to read a suite um, of three poems later in this book, um, Restoration, which um, is part of the latter section that I was talking about before, is sort of awakening to the senses. Um, these poems have a, a title um, uniting them. The title is called Inventions. And um, the story behind them is that um, several poets, including myself, um, were commissioned by the Poetry Foundation in Chicago to write a series of poems based on um, Bach's two-part inventions um, for piano. Um, and so we did so. And we um, performed the poems with the piano um, performance. So we, we performed with pianists. Um, doing the Bach two-part inventions, um, which is a, a really wonderful thing to be a part of. Um, the, the, the third part, the third poem of these that I'm going to read called Green World, another interesting thing about this, 
um, I was asked um, uh, sort of on the eve or at the moment of Barack Obama's first inauguration um, to write something in celebration of his presidency of the inauguration. Um, and it, it proved a little too difficult to write something from scratch right then. Um, but what I did was um, I actually submitted this third part of this invention suite called Green World, which is about joy, um, as you'll hear. And so now I kind of associate it with the inauguration of Barack Obama, even though it, it did not start out that way. So um, this is called Inventions. Um, number one is, um, it's called Psalm Invention in the West, and it's uh, inspired by Bach's two-part invention number two in C minor. If I were to shimmer in a pool in the canyon, if afternoon rain burned the gem that is water, if precipitation pooled as lapis in the slick rock, encrusted westward in a turtle shell, stippled, painted in the world not for us, if a maiden hair fern were reflected there, effaced by the cloud's hand arabesque and index, an aphora in the rocks over the pool, if my body were broken in the fault, if a reed thins to music and fractures and repairs, if I followed, if I leapt across the rock, if I listened hard to your voice without music, if it spoke to me, cantabile, if I followed, if the paintbrush pooled, if you carried me down, if the two of us repelled to sea level. Two is arc away. And it's Bach's two-part invention number seven in E minor. Um, it has a couple of words in it that might be unfamiliar. One is brio, um, which is sort of the, the vibrant um, quality in music. The other is the, the Latin phrase ex machina, like deus ex machina, sort of like the ghost in the machine. Um, so when something is brought in near the end of a play, seemingly out of nowhere, <laughs> to solve it, that's the deus ex machina, the ghost in the machine. Arc away. <clears throat> Love is bad brio. Why do you stroke its adrenaline engine, its hummingbird emblem, all microscopic motor, indigo dispersing in a whirl? Do you see how hysteria trumps hue? How the heart has sublimed the wings, eaten every instinct for solitary distances? A bird should arc away, not hover there ex machina, plumb above the runoff, creature evaporate and still. Do you hear his motor humming like a stone? Are you sand blind? What ails you? The vanishing point burns beckoning and blue. Number three, green world. You see the face of Barack Obama hovering above this one. <laughs> Glenn, box two-part invention in number 12 in A major. And this one was played by Glenn Gould. Um, not the, those other two that I did, I wasn't listening to the Glenn Gould recordings. Um, and when you listen to Glenn Gould playing these inventions or many of the things that he recorded, it's so different from any other Bach uh, re recording that you hear. And one of the things that you hear is um, him speaking to himself and singing to himself as he plays. Green World. When it's stiller, you can hear his voice tinkering behind the notes, hammering, truing, as he damned or corked the instrument. Now, though, his cup runneth over, as in all the clear creeks of the west. Trouts are pirouetting from the water, then writing on the air. Sunflowers arc, their coppers and darks, in swaths articulate as digital photography. Can these be the imprints of our new imaginations? Where is joy but in these silken bolts of rhetoric, in delicate turnings of hyperbole? Um, the last poem I'll read um, from Restoration is 
uh, a thousand cranes. Um, this poem is for my mom. And uh, what this poem is referencing is um, a, a style of piecing quilts in the 19th century, in the mid 19th century, um, in which all of these various triangles were put together to form um, these, these very beautiful quilts. Um, and as you see in the, in the poem, there are hundreds of them. Um, and they're all very individualized. So um, it's bringing together a lot of magpie <laughs> um, types of designs, things like that, to be this, um, this quilt. Um, the other thing that it references is uh, the Freudian notion of Fort Da. So when Freud talked about Fort Da, um, it was an instance of a child sort of throwing a spool away and then bringing it um, to him again. So um, throwing it away, bringing it close, it's a kind of back and forth that happens. And um, I won't go into it any more than that, but um, that's all you really need to know for, for this. 1,000 cranes. The name of the quilt is Flying Geese. It's a pieced quilt um, circa 1845-1850. In those days, a couple went to bed with geese. 826 triangles flown northward in calico. Each bird paired to wing spread and a compass point of head. There was a terrain that held them at a distance root and tumbleweed stenciled in the chintz that pieced the unmarked trail beneath their feathers, sparks of earth that fell away from bird's eye, marrying geometry and spores. Like our digital cameras for da, or sudden willows grown behind the blinds of my youngest childhood home in the Midwest. The cloth tracks are running distant as brooks, seen from the locked towers of dream, while isosceles rush over the plain's surface, no shape cut from the same dress or drape. The triangles are lace or a tangle of bike spokes, or three points fence the scalloped edges of Corinthians. And now her body stirs beneath the cloth. Let me see a triangle of sky, she told him, right before I die. But I think that voice belongs to a woman who lives here now, who also asked her husband for the possible, to watch a stream of birds migrate on the television propped above her bed, to return to the seat of her oldest ideas, where a thousand cranes glide in a girl's silk pocket, mathematical, sublime, and small. She almost feels the wings against her hip. So moving now to Grains of the Voice, um, which is the, the new book that I'm very happy about, that it's in the world now. <laughs> um, <coughs> Grains of the Voice is a, is a quotation, really. Um, it's, a, it's a variant of a quotation from uh, Roland Barthes, the, the French literary critic. <coughs> And um, it's the epigraph for the book, um, Grains of the Voice, and I'll just read it for you so you know what he's talking about. Um, he says, the grain, the grain of the voice, when the latter is in a dual posture, a dual production of language and of music. So it's about um, trying to find a seam between music and language. And there are many ways of, of doing that, and poetry does that always in, in many different ways. Um, this, this book does it in, in a number of different ways, sometimes by using snatches of songs, other times um, just by trying to um, make that musicality happen in the lines. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read from it is called Inflection. And it concerns a, a cloistered nun um, who is also a cheese expert. Um, she, she really exists. <laughs> Um, inflection. They are white planets in a galaxy 
these wheels of cheese before the fungi nobble the skin, cobble some resistance in the rind. Deep in the cool caves of Auvergne, a nun sets the circles on shelves so their surfaces will stain, sheen, stipple, shade. While above her, a Latin chant folds many women in one voice. If glass were music, could it sound like this? How can we call those words human when they've flown so far from our commerce, our marketplace? Every mold that steeps the skin is local, grafted and endangered as the dead letters become notes floating still in vowels from the nun's grill. This poem is called Stain. And maybe you see, you've seen the bittersweet growing in the fall. Um, the, the berries, especially uh, a little bit even more northerly in New England, you, you see them growing wild. Stain, bittersweet, gold, red, indelible berry, its branches swirling in a tangle. Every autumn, we drive southeast to where the bushes line the roads in Rhode Island. Once in November, I watch my friend's dark sweater dip and disappear, then rise above the tall bleached winter grass, the teasel. Glamorous, that distant pine flashing in a field steeped in momentary golden. And strange are the shades that linger here from youth, a terrain compounding confession and silence. I'm changing this just a bit. <laughs> so it's great to have my family here, as I said. And my sister was teaching this poem called I and Now, so I really want to read it for her. Um, one thing to know about it is I'm a huge um, Emmy Lou Harris fan and um, went to hear a concert that she was doing about a, a few years ago. That's who's being referenced in this poem is Emmy Lou Harris. Uh, I and thou. Must we cultivate our kindness? Can we book a fellow feeling for the sake of the fellow, not the ghost? Last night, for example, the white-haired girl told us singing was like praying, and that iron of naturalized note in the bluegrass made me want to say sublime, sublime to myself, in the sapphic sense that knows sublimity as love. Oh, wash me green as yonder field. And the girl's reed song did light from the stage, constellating phrases like heavens divided in a quaver formed between forte and whisper, acute supple wavers among syllables and slants. And now may you keep me close within your ear. I can hear the voice I loved when I wondered at its dialect. You know, if I'm ever able to speak, I'll want someone human to answer me. Um, if anyone here is a Dionne Warwick fan, or at least remembers her, um, and or um, the, the songwriting of uh, Hal David and Burt Bacharach, well then you might recall distantly um, a song that began, Do You Know the Way to San Jose, right? <laughs> um, th this poem is interested in that song and um, put it together with the Crab Nebula yeah, up in the galaxies. Um, the one thing you might remember about the song is that there's a joke in the end, right? That 
Um, you know, the idea is everybody goes to LA to try to be a star, and then they tell you you're going to be a star in a week or two weeks. But then all the stars that never were are parking cars and pumping gas. Right? It, I learned the song when I was a very, very little kid, and I, I never understood what it meant until I was a lot older. But it's like it's a big come down from being Hollywood star, what you dream of being, to, to actually pumping gas. But what about now when nobody's even pumping, you can't even get a job pumping gas anymore. So persistent tune, persistent tune. Do you know the way to San Jose? And all the stars that never if a supernova smokes out in interstellar swan song, the never surely calcifies, it necklaces incipient. Upon its burst, a parent star will limb the sweet lumens of crab nebula, sky trash crystallized as oceanic offspring. A thorax dazzles, and its claws are hydrogen. It burrows as it torches northern lights, and you, a culted near star up creek in California, could soon lose your money, jump a slow freight train, and beatific alter the tenor of the night. But who could get a job pumping gas these days? Nobody, not least the stars that never were. Um, this Next poem is called Water Music. Um, and it also has uh, a line from a song in it, but it's a little bit later in time. It's um, the 80s group Duran Duran. Her name is Rio. <laughs> and uh, it also begins, um, the, the first uh, line of the poem is taken from a poem by John Ashbery. So this is called Water Music. I can do what I want to do, but I want to stay here, said someone's girlfriend, draped as a piece of real technology. Yes, she nearly danced as a river, following one arm to the estuary's break, or pasting a quilt of refractive light upon many square inches of her body. A scarfskin map lies infinite, and a river turns like mercury in the mind. It shines there as folklore, as floodgate, as copper foil for beach glass. This is why we say her name is Rio, and why I'm learning love requires a trawl net, an act of free will. Someone is singing at the dark end of the street, the velvet of her voice covered over. I'm going to read just two more poems. Uh, this poem, um, Eidolon, um, is interested in um, the making of glass flowers. Um, there is a whole glass flower museum up in Cambridge, Mass, um, at Harvard University. And these glass flowers were um, really precise replicas um, of, of plants that were made um, for scientific study. And it's, it's really interesting to go and, and see how lifelike um, these glass flowers are. And one of the things that you learn in going there is that um, the people who were making glass flowers were also making glass eyes. So, they were making not only glass flowers, but you know, replacing eyes um, with, with glass eyes. Um, so, so this kind of contemplates that convergence. Um, it does refer to the macula, um, which is sort of if you have a thinning of the macula, then you are losing your eyesight. So this is called Eidolon. Have you noticed how translucently these red maple leaves wave? Shot silk. Light shot, something nearly right, but not. Nanometers of depth were surely shivered from the leaf, as when we say a hair's breadth to codify everything the eye can't stripe or striate as difference. 
since the soft uniform coat, the uniform of darkness, our eye by definition will try to allay. And if the macula thins, then every passing face must whirl the same. The undulated maple leaves aren't vegetable, but glass, pulled and protocrinkled by a man who made an ethic of mimesis, whose blown glass iris was equivalent in glimmer to the one brown eye still wet in the socket. Um, the last poem I'll read is called Heideggerian. And it's considering the philosopher Heidegger a bit um, and his concept of presence um, with a few appearances by various and sundry musicians. One is Elvis, <laughs> um, one is James Brown, and one is the um, 1970s group Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah, it's a pretty elemental name for anything, really. Heideggerian. If we want to stretch to reach a world that's not us, the arc and arch and the feather of the imminent, we'll need to listen carefully to all that surrounds us, the ravening glow of the Elvis lamp, florid at the hairline lips and cheek, or James Brown's miniature bare chest rippling in the window of the Salvation Army. Remember the council of earth, wind, and fire. If worlding's not in us, but in things, it follows that by dancing we can make ourselves a pretty thing. That Japanese anemone's three blooms bloomed as if chiseled for months, as if some ragged pastry bag had sculpted them in sugar. Thank you. Thank you. Christina has graciously said if anyone has any questions, that she would take them at this time. Thank you. If anyone has anything for her, please just raise your hand. You have a teacher at the very end of high school that inspired me. Yeah, I had some great teachers at the Darien High School, and I don't know if any of them are here anymore, you know, still at the Darien High School, but um, Leonard, Leonard Krill, um, Betsy Hamilton, um, Bill Jacobs, um, Geraldine Marshall. Um, we're all wonderful, and I know I'm I'm um, forgetting forgetting some, but they were all terrific. So, do you make notes uh, in the course of the year when you see something that just um, brings to light some phrase or whatever? Yeah, I I do. Um, I think that's that's part of being receptive to the world and to what you see and encounter around you. Um, and in fact, I was just reprimanded <laughs> at a museum because you know I, I take a lot of notes in, in museums and things like that. It's just it's part of the whole inspirational mill. And the last museum I was in, you know, I was sort of given a pencil very um, <laughs> in this sort of putting in, into my face sort of um, because nobody was supposed to write with a ballpoint pen. but. Um, I just try to explain, well, I take these notes for myself. I'm not going to do anything untoward with them. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a big part of it, um, is you know, being able to be receptive at any time. And for that reason, yeah, taking notes and then bringing them home to the computer and, and working with them. Absolutely. Yeah. Christina, I love the poem in tribute to John Fiorello. And um, Thank you. as many don't know, I also was a neighbor of John's, and, and he was a, a, a wonderful man. When he, did he literally leave a book of days under a fir tree? <laughs> yeah, um, he, he left a, a um, it, was, it was like a far side calendar. It was, you know those, <laughs> you know those calendars that you rip off the, the days of? 
So he had bought that and he had left it for my dad, yeah. So, um, so when I say he wanted you to laugh every evening, uh, that's part of what that was about. So he, yeah, he had that, he had that in mind. Yeah. Where do you like to go a little stolfing inside of you for inspiration? Mm. What a great question. It is a really great question. Um, I think so many different places. Um, I think memory and snatches of language um, from reading and from conversations. I, I mean, I, that's one thing I've, I've realized more and more about myself in, in the work is that um, conversations with people are, are really important to me. I hang on to the exact phrasing sometimes that, that will give rise to something else. And if you're talking about the body itself, that's such an interesting question. Um, you know, that where, where does inspiration reside? Does it reside in the heart? You know, does it reside in the brain? I just have to say for me, both. <laughs> I think um, that those two things have to be in dialogue with one another. What a great question. Yeah. When you, when you take your notes and you begin your writing process, how much of your poem is a surprise and how much do you really know you're heading there? Mm. I think of that with the poem of the glass flowers and the eye because yeah. you did both and you incorporated both. Yeah. I think, um, you know, with almost every poem, you don't know exactly how it's going to end up or you want to be able to take the ride with it. Um, of course, you know, you then have to come back and work it to, to make sure that it works. <laughs> Um, so I, I think, you know, as with so many of these sorts of questions, it also sometimes varies from poem to poem. I mean, some poems have much more of an element of surprise than others. Um, and also the question is like, where does the surprise reside? Um, you, you know, the poem Rotary was a poem that I had wanted to write for a really long time. And um, there was nothing surprising about doing it for me because it had been in my being for a long time. Um, but then the precise places that it went, you know, were surprising at the time. So um, like when I started, you know, when I was thinking I was going to write about the rotary phone, I wasn't necessarily thinking I was also going to write, write about the phone booth. <laughs> but then I realized that missing the rotary phone, you had to miss the phone booth. I really thought there was something missing with the phone booths gone, you know, with that sort of little, those little glass houses. So. Um, so yeah, it's never something that's precisely you know mapped out, but there's a sense of where you want to go and um, following it. Yeah. Um. In college, uh, did you get involved with a group and/or professor or so who were tremendous stimulation? And is that really available in a lot of colleges? Like don't think it probably is. So how did that work for you? Uh, is that a help in mm. getting you mm -hmm. going? Yeah, um, I think, well, for me, um, it's interesting. I, um, I didn't take uh, poetry workshops in college, um, but I was a double major um, in English and French. So I took a ton of literature courses um, and was very inspired by the literature that I was reading. Um, and also did you know a little bit of writing for the literary magazine and things like that, um, but you know not I, I wasn't um, full time you know involved in some kind of writing group or anything like that. Um, you know I, I I really didn't do that until later. So I I feel as if the undergrad sort of college experience for me was um, was about reading a lot. Um, and you know, beginning to write, but mostly really imbibing um, the literature and, and the reading in all the great courses that I took, in sort of in, in in English literature and also in French. So that's it's different for everyone, but that's how it was for me. So, yeah. I marvel at your choice of words. You were talking about music. And Thank words, you. And Thank you. It's lyrical. Maybe part of it is your voice, but I would say your choice of words to me is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Uh, you mentioned uh, a reference to a lot of music in all of this. Are there any artists today that you're gotten you going here and them that you're thinking about? Mm -hmm. um, the singer uh, Mark Kozlik. There's a, there's a poem inspired by him in here. Um, and he, he was, you know, he, he's very prolific um, songwriter and, and performer. Um, he's always coming out with a, with a new album. Um, he was with the group um, Red House Painters in the 90s and Sun Kill Moon. Um, and, he, and he still puts out albums with them and he also does his own solo work. And um, he is interesting to me very interesting to me, both because of the quality of his voice itself when he sings, the way that he uses his voice when he sings, um, and also how he returns to older songs. He does a lot of cover songs, and he transforms them in, in ways that are just completely unforeseeable. And um, so I think with him, he, he's somebody who also really embodies this grain of the voice thing to and just a huge sensitivity to um, the sounds of, of consonants and vowels and words, the way that he sings, um, the way that he puts those things together in syntax is just phenomenal. So um, I, I'd say he'd be a great example of somebody who's really working now who, who I find very inspiring. Yeah. Do you have a favorite poet? Oh, man. <laughs> um, uh, I, it's a great question. I have so many favorite poets. That's why it's so hard to answer. Um, you know, historically, um, I love Emily Dickinson, um, Wallace Stevens. I love Robert Frost. Um, you know, in, in terms of people writing now, some of my favorite poets are um, Ed Roberson, Linda Beards, Linda Gregerson. Um, but I, I tend to have a very... Um, voracious <laughs> appetite with these things and try not to read just one um, type of, of poem. Um, so many, many favorites. So. Yes? Well, I just want to tell you, um, again, your, your words are inspiring, but I just want to tell you that I think that your vocabulary is so wonderful, your education shows up, your philosophical, all these courses, wonderful courses you took. But, but what other interests do you have that you inform? Because, I mean, your poetry is very intellectual. But yet you have got, you know, this sensory side to it, too. And it's, yeah. So I was just wondering, sort of in your life, you know, the courses in Carmel, but then were you an English teacher and then you, you know, branched out? When did you really start to you write your first book? And, you know, that they're really, where you going to make your living? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I was trained, um, with a doctorate in comparative literature, um, so I um, was working as a professor uh, before I published my first book of poetry. Um, you know, I have a, I have some pretty strong intellectual interests. Um, I, I mean, I think I'm also somebody who enjoys being in the sensory world, um, and you know share a home with somebody um, who is not an intellectual, um, who is very focused um, on sort of the everyday material aspects of things. And I think that is a really great um, influence and combination. Um, but so what I did was um, I, I got a doctorate in comparative literature. I ended up um, going getting an MFA, uh, Master of the Fine Arts in, in Poetry after that. Um, and then um, wrote the, the manuscript that became, wrote, wrote the book Rotary there. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there was a lot of, of preparation. Yeah. Thank you. Can you talk a little about your experience as a reader for Poetry Magazine, what you look for, how it influences your own writing negatively or positively? <laughs> Both, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I am a consulting editor at, at Poetry. Um, I have been uh, doing reading for the magazine for uh, almost 10 years now. 
Um, and, you know, I, I just kind of tell people there's, there's no magic formula. Everyone wants to know <laughs> how to get published in Poetry Magazine, and, you know, there's no magic formula for it. Um, you know, the, the vision and the range of what we're looking for is capacious. Um, it's not just one type of poem that's being looked for. It's really a large range. Um, but it's got to work. I mean, it's, it's, it's got to sort of do what it wants to. It's like what he says in, in what I say in here, I, I can do what I want to do. Um, you know, being able to do what you want to do well. Um, and, you know, so I think one of the things that makes the magazine really interesting and really unique is that very openness to a really broad range of styles and aesthetics. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for poems that um, are really, you know, startling, um, interesting, well done, well handled. Um, you know, they might be very lyrical, they might be less lyrical. They might be very talky. Um, they might be, you know, more or less musical or any of those things. Um, but they've got to make you believe in them as poems. You know, it's like you've got to believe in what the poet is putting in front of you. Um, and, you know, for me, a lot of it is surprise, too. You know, I, I see so much work. Um, a, a lot of it is predictable. If somebody can surprise me um, with something, that's a, that's, a great, uh, that, that's a great experience. Um, you know, as to how it influences, oops, my own work, um, I think, uh, for me, it, I try to keep the two things separate, for the most part, um, just because you sort of have to. I mean, it's just the influx of, of work is, is so much that one could be overwhelmed by it otherwise. So, you know, it's, it's a good job for someone who's good at compartmentalization, which, which I'm good at. So, um, you know, but it, yeah, it, you know, there, there are the occasional inspiring, really inspiring things that you see. And, and those moments are incredibly wonderful, just amazing. Um, you know, those moments don't happen every day, <laughs> but they do happen. Um, and when they do, you know, it's, it's really like nothing else. Because just think about it, you know, it's like, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And when you find that thing, you're, you're pretty psyched, you know. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh -huh. There was some, you know, the Poetry Foundation, something right, right. substantial behind it. And I was just wondering, and the recent, the uh, current poem Gloria, I think it's one of the poetry, each other home poetry. And I'm just wondering if you see any, um, I don't know, new things for out there in the world to spread poetry in some ways Yeah. Um, and, you know, this is something the Poetry Foundation is great at. Um, I don't have, you can, you can see I'm writing about a rotary phone. I don't have a smartphone, but um, I know that a lot of people love the Poetry Foundation app um, on their smartphones. And as I understand it, that's, you know, that's just a way to have kind of random poems appear on your, yes, yeah. And, and I think people really get a lot out of that. So. I think that's a that's a great thing, um, and you know I I think that it's you know these um, these sorts of things are really out there um, for people, especially you know with the web. Um, there, there's all kinds of things out there on the web. There's you know Poetry Daily, Verse Daily that you know sort of um, posting a, a poem a day, things like that. I think a lot of people these days are getting a lot of sustenance, um, poetic sustenance from the web. Um, and you know, in Chicago, um, it, Chicago has become a very poetry-centric town um, with the Poetry Foundation being there um, and having received so much money, as most of you probably know about. Um, and so there, there are always um, different programs going on um, there, including things like 
you know, programs for high school students, um, reciting, you know, poems um, and things like that. So I think it's, you know, I think the Poetry Foundation is a great resource to begin with, you know, when you're sort of wanting um, poetry as a, as a kind of more of a constant in your life. I think that's a great place to start. Um, is there yes. any discussion at the foundation about the future of poetry books? I'm mm. thinking of the demise of the place to go into Borders books to the poetry section that's pretty large in Stanford and browse and pick out somebody new. And yeah. now I don't really have that way to do that browsing, and so I'm not picking up something yeah. like your book where. If I'm not coming to a reading like this, I'm not discovering somebody that yeah. maybe I should be discovering. And yeah. I don't know who's going to deal with that problem, but I think it is an ongoing problem as the bookstores are diminishing. Yeah, it is. Um, we're at a very strange place for publishing right now, especially poetry publishing, um, in my experience. Um, what's odd is that. You know, as you as you say, the distribution and the um, the outlets for really getting it to the reader, as you say, are are diminishing, and yet publishing itself isn't stopping or diminishing. It's like if you read the New York Times <laughs> or many uh, media outlets out there, you will start believing that things just aren't being published in print anymore. My experience is the opposite. Um, you know, especially working for poetry. Um, they're just all of these presses um, that, that are popping up all the time, small presses that, you know, um, that, that are popping up in print. Um, you know, so it's, in a way, it's a big mystery to me. Um, I, I do think that, um, you know, as I said, it's a certain amount of it is going to be picked up more by the web. Um, some of that is happening now. Um, but we're certainly not at the place where everyone is just publishing ebooks. I mean, people are publish still publishing print books. Um, but I mean, you're putting your finger on a really difficult problem. Um, you know, I, I think that some people really want to take it more grassroots um, with things like you know having things available at readings and, and this and that. But we're just going to have to see. Um, especially with a lot of these new young presses, what their futures are going to be, um, and I, I think that's an that's an open open question. Um, yeah. I would urge you to consider the fact that there are ten thousand libraries in this country, public. And yes. Another twenty. <laughs> yes. All yes. of which have good book collections. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you're so right that that's, um, you know, that's still a great market for, for poetry collections. You're so right. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. Okay. I saw it. And then. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you were, excuse the phrase, so thoroughly compartmentalized. <laughs> um, is there a compartment of your psyche that you haven't explored yet or that you were afraid to explore? No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I, I, I don't think so. Um, no, I mean, to, to, to not to be glib about it, um, you know, it, in a way, my book restoration um, allowed me to do some of that. I didn't read everything that's in there. Um, you know, dreams are a manifestation of the unconscious. Um, and working through dreams and through, you know, so, some of the, the dream situations in the book are, are not so lovely. Um, you know, that was an aspect of the book that was important to me. Um, and so I think, you know, in part, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I no, I, I don't feel um, a fear about that. So, thanks. Yep. Yes, I just maybe you've answered part of this question, but recently um, I read something about Moby, who was at school about the same time you were, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that he found it difficult at Darien High School because of his great interest in the arts and music. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
he wasn't one of the ones out on the playing field with the sports mind right. account. And I just wondered how you would relate to that and how you felt, um, Jerry and I, well, I mean, Moby was a rock star even then. <laughs> really, we thought he was, like, very cool. And he felt, <laughs> at least in this interview, he said he felt a little bit on the, on the outside of the majority of, of the students. Um, yeah, I, I get it. Um, <laughs> I think... Um, one, one thing that was great um, for me about Darien High School was that, yeah, I mean, I'm sure I was on the outside too, but I didn't really think that much about it. I was doing my own stuff. <coughs> so was he. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that was one thing that was great about Darien High School, actually, because it was a big enough school mm -hmm. that you could kind of do your own thing. Um, if you wanted to, and not uh, not feel like people were watching you too much, um, you know, I'd say. I mean, personally, for me, middle school was a lot, lot, lot worse. A lot worse. <laughs> Darien High School was, you know, was was okay. Um, and and somebody asked me about teachers, and I think that was a great thing. I mean, I think um, you know the fantastic teachers that we had, um, who really encouraged us to be ourselves. You know, and to and to explore these interests and, and go our way. You know, th those teachers were very very important. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.